Where to start? Yeah? Definitely go back to those resources if you find them valuable. You'll remember this image from week 8, uh, which had ni la tierra ni las mujeres como territorio de conquista. Neither women nor the earth are the territory of conquest. So this is a very contestatory phrase, isn't it? In the face of 500 years of colonialism, but also the ongoing assaults on land, on life, on women, on women's bodies as well, yeah? And the lecture is entitled Transversal Feminisms, Connecting Bodies and Territories. And that's very deliberate. It's not my idea. I'm largely drawing on, as we see, the work of someone such as Lorena Carbonell. And I'll show you what I mean shortly. But I'm also wanting to keep in focus the idea of connections beyond that, or even that inform that, such as ancestral knowledges, which I made reference to just earlier and that really grounds the work of someone like Sarah Simota. So, um, we just had Mother's Day, which is a highly commercial kind of thing, isn't it? You sort of get guilt tripped, have you bought your mother a present? Yeah. <laughs> I happened to be, I think, in Cobra just before Mother's Day, and there was a sign at train station saying, do you love your mother? Buy this, and I'm like, what do you want me to say? <laughs> Okay, there I am as a child. You see me? Un niño llorón. In Spanish, you would say a sort of uh, snotty nose, crying, mummy boy. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I obviously need, needed my mum on that day. <laughs> uh, but my mum, like, she, she is one of those really important people in my life. She was. She. Uh, died about three years ago, coming up to three years ago, and in the past, last three years of her life, I was really involved in her care. Uh, some people see that as an incidental in life, but I actually think that as difficult as it was, it was really central to understanding my priorities. It really helped me to wake up to a lot of that. But I suppose, whether in life or sickness and even in death, my mum always had a lot of lessons for me. Doesn't mean that we always got along, but the circle or circumstance is that I was privileged to be with her, especially during the pandemic in the last six months of her life and leave Sydney to do so. So I always want to bring her back into this context because I think it's important to think about who our um, lineage is who makes up our lineages, especially if we're thinking about politics in the feminine or the feminist or feminized resistances, right? Who are those important women in our lives? It doesn't have to be a mother biologically. You might even think about grandmothers. So there's a little Google Doc that you're welcome to play with uh, where I just give a sort of account of the importance of my own mum in my life things that I've never forgotten. For example, just how much she just sort of like worked and worked and worked. And, um, you know, she was a single mum. And she had like amongst us really six kids. So uh, I remember all the sacrifices that she used to have to make and working at night, doing menial jobs as well as being a mum. I remember telling her that one day like, mum, you did all this, and she said, what made you think about all that? In other words, I just got on with it, but you've made a list. <laughs> so she had a good sense of humour. But she used to say as well, Earth is a school, okay? Anything that happens, any challenges that happen to us, they, they're not necessarily going to lead us to the path of freedom directly, but they're going to help us learn, right? But Earth is a school. I mean, partly because of her father's background, who was Anglo Indian, she also had a belief in reincarnation, which I struggled with because I'm kind of very rational in some ways, although I'm drawn to things that seemingly are classified as otherwise. Uh, I do like the idea of consciousness out there as being this phenomenon, epiphenomenon, that we just do not understand. And 
who knows what happens to any of us, you know, when we shuffle off the mortal coil. But um, reincarnation still has a kind of logic to it, and so my mum really embraced it because to her it was a path back to her ancestry as well. She was a yoga teacher back before it was a popular thing, right? I mean, I'm showing my age here, but people used to think it was satanic in Australia. Yeah. And so you have to sort of do it on the down low, you know? But my mum worked in women's centres doing classes of yoga for women, women in all sorts of circumstances, including who had experienced crisis. My mum herself had, we as a family had, that's kind of our history, right? Um, and so, you know, that shows my political sensitivities and my alignments in life. They're formed by my experiences, by my mother's experience, how she survived those things and how she got us out of those circumstances as well, right? But I think that that's really important for us to ground our thinking, our knowledge, our feeling as well, feel thinking within those experiences and that they are valid places for theorizing, right? So who came before us? Can you think of any women in your lives? The boys in the room, it could be a girlfriend. It could be an ex. <laughs> I've been for a bucket. But grandmothers, people who are symbolically so, to whom you turn. Yeah? So just, just think about those women that came before us and how it's important for us to think about those connections of importance yeah, in everything we do and how we move through the world. So um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the Lenka Defensora, land defender, uh, who won the 2015 Emma Goldman Prize, Berta Cáceres. Uh, here she's referred to as an environmental leader. She was involved in a long-term struggle against a mega dam, yeah, being developed in Honduras on Lenca land. And she was a co-founder and coordinator of the Council of Popular Indigenous Organizations of Honduras. Even having the recognition internationally that she had, including with the Emma Goldman Prize, she was still vulnerable. I mean, I don't want to undermine her long uh, contribution, long-term contribution within this organisation and within what we might understand as territorial feminism as well. But her death was something that needn't have happened, but to be sure occurred because of the interests of that particular mega project company and the fact that the National Guard that sort of, you know, had this kind of corrupt relationship, economic interests in the country, and is trained by the US, erupted into her living quarters and, and gunned her down, targeted her. And this happens to a lot of environmental activists worldwide, right? And I don't want to go into all the gory details, but you know, there's, it's a politics of risk when not criminalization. Some scholars and commentators have made the point that we need to think about feminicide, femicide in English, in connection to territory, because, well, Rita Sagata would say, women's bodies are held up as a sign, you know, in, on which the forces of violence themselves are inscribed to serve as an example to community and for those in struggle, to inhibit popular resistance. And so the gender politics of it is more than just you know, she was a woman, she was more vulnerable as a woman. It's because of the ramifications of what it means at the community level for a leader such as her who is so important. Being a woman, political protagonist, and the ramifications of that, that right? And, you know, you probably gleaned a little bit from previous conversations that uh, mining economies and other extractivist economies are deeply gendered. They're deeply male dominant. They operate by logic of um, 
domination, really. And they inscribe, you know, economies of gendered and sexual violence themselves. But in this particular video, and I'm going to um, show a little bit, her children remember her as mother. <laughs> Berta Cáceres era mi mami, su fuerza era también un llamado a hacerse cargo de las cosas a sí mismo y ella nos enseña a asumirnos guerreras y guerreros y a pelear esa vida. De sentirse también parte de los hombres y mujeres eh, que viven en situaciones de represión, eh, de, que viven todas las diferentes formas de dominación. Se nos impone justamente eso de que no podemos soñar, que no tenemos la capacidad para transformar esta realidad y ella demuestra que se puede. Yo creo que el legado que nos deja mi mami es el legado de sentir este, el sentido de la justicia, la rebeldía. Nos asumimos orgullosas y orgullosos eh, el pueblo eh, de la Empira, el pueblo Lenca también de la Empira y, y de Berta, que es nuestra mamá y nuestra líder. La muerte eh, no nos va a parar, eh, que eh, el, eh, su dinero eh, no vale más que nuestras vidas, eh, que no somos daños colaterales, que la, la muerte y que nuestra madre, que hoy nuestra madre no esté acá, no es un daño colateral. Es una vida que perdimos y es una vida que nos había dado y que nos sigue dando esperanza que nos enseñó un camino y que nos enseñó otras formas de relacionarnos. A seis meses del asesinato de Berta Cáceres, mi mami, exigimos justicia. Los invitamos a sumar su voz para exigir justicia por el asesinato de mi mamá, ingresando a greenpeace.org. against the Awasaka band. But also, her, her status as a woman has encouraged other women to get up, right? A new generation of women leaders in Latin America, these leaders leave the intersectionality between class, race, and gender not as lies a crisscross, but in every breath that they take. She passed on to her children and members of the organization COPIN, C O P I N H, the Lenka Indigenous Worldview and Conviction that Mother Earth must be protected. She insisted that environmental activism means setting up to patriarchal forces that destroy the planet and that the defense of territory is the defense of women's rights because patriarchy claims women's bodies as its territory. Drawing upon Julieta Paredes from Mujeres Creando, Women Creating, a Bolivian anarcho feminist collective. She has a performance piece which is called El Ando Fino desde el Feminismo Comunitario, fine weaving or threading through community feminism. So this idea of weaving and threading is really important to these articulations. She calls this a performance that is not a performance. Okay, let's think about that for a moment. What is this ontological status? Is it merely a, a mise-en-scene, something put in the scene to entertain, to theatralize, theatralize, like a show? No, for her, it is putting the body in it, right? And in this particular performance of hers, she transforms during her presentation from so-called Western clothes, as you can see on the left, right? And in so doing, transforms visibly into an indigenous woman, she is indigenous, wearing the typical garments that are associated with the Chola woman in Bolivia and Diemo. 
Paredes claims that in Bolivia nobody looks at me when I'm dressing as a chola. We become invisible. Saying that cholas don't have a body, don't have a sexuality, don't have ideas, Paredes proposes to engage in political part participation through and with her body. She insists that what she's doing is not performance, but an actual transmission of her sister's and her people's thoughts and demands through her voice and her body. In this manner, she brings to presence the very topics she is discussing, being that of women's corporal reality, and the, that corporality being at the centre of colonisation itself. She proposes that resistance and contestation against colonialism in any of its guises must come from feminine bodies. Thus, the task of recovering women's corporeal reality and sexuality is at the basis of her proposal for a communal feminism. So, putting the body in it, the phrase in Spanish that's used in circles of women organizing is poner el cuerpo. Yeah? And of course, we saw that in the aforementioned performance anthem of Las Pestes, right? A red fist in your palm. Does everyone remember seeing that clip? Mm -hmm. Okay. And as I said, they're inspired by the feminist theories of Rita Segato and Silvia Pellicci. So obviously it's gone outside and beyond just Latin America as well. Now during the pandemic, Las Tesis found that they had to actually organise differently because, for example, even you know, subsequent to the October outbreak, but especially within the conditions of confinement, people weren't really allowed to circulate in public space in the months that followed the October outbreak because that was the beginning of the pandemic, right? In the of 2020. I think the times were all <laughs> But anyway, um, so they instead did things such as project words onto buildings in this financial center of the capital of Santiago. And one of them was Hunger. Because like of the resource strain, particularly in such a brutal distance of Santiago, the supply of common goods and, and also health and medicine was really precarious at that point. And so it was to reinsert within public space, using as well a body politics, yeah, because there's nothing more bodily than hunger, right? That these 
substantive issues are not just going to go away. The things that led to that October outbreak were not just going to be interrupted by this pandemic. In fact, the pandemic was just going to make it worse, right? So um, they projected this on um, buildings in uh, Santiago, putting in Plaza Dignidad. And I use this quotation from the Lebanese-Canadian poet Trish Salah. Um, hunger and its competence, I tried to pitch against the body politic, just to sort of create an elusive association. That the body is, you know, what our first territory, as many decolonial feminists in Latin America would say, but it's also connected to the body politic in some way, whether through the denial of certain bodies and the transiting in public space, the feminization of certain bodies, but also as the grounds of the political. So body politics to derive and to return to this notion from Virginia Vargas posits the body as something broader than just a mere physiology. Uh, it's a place of multiple positions, spaces of struggle and transgression. Body as territory imagines the body as a well, from the contribution of indigenous women's movements and their struggles against extractivism. It insists on the harmony between women's bodies and the cosmos as being foundation. The racialized body is found in anti-racist campaigns, for example, by Afro-Brazilian and Latin Caribbean feminists. Questioning the sexual body or the sex body has led to a re-signification of sex and gender as well in movements of trans and intersex activists in Latin America and worldwide. For Rita Segato, there is a direct relationship as well between capital and death, between unregulated accumulation and concentration of wealth, and the sacrifice of poor brown mestiza women devoured by the cracks in which they are articulated, in which are articulated the monetary and symbolic economy and the control of resources and the power of death. So, women's body, to continue with her line of thought, becomes, as I said, a sign or a canvas on which the marks of the pedagogy of cruelty, as she theorizes it, are expressed, including in wars of different kinds, the war of politics, of armed actors and interests, and of predatory development, women's bodies and violence inscribed on them through actual violent acts, becomes a form of holding up women as a lesson. Yeah? There's also a contestation of those forms of ascription and violence of violence on, on bodies, which is to insist on body as first territory, but also the connection between body and territory. Yeah? So this conception of territorio cuerpo tierra territory, body, earth, or body territory has been used as a political slogan by indigenous Maya Thinka women in Guatemala and is central to the communitarian feminist political projects that are happening there. It bridges the ongoing struggles of indigenous women to defend their territories against extractive exploitation with the historical and contemporary violation of indigenous women's bodies, which also happened during the so-called civil war there which was of long duration. I say so-called civil war, because we say civil war, but half the time it's a military state and that violence on, on particular segments of the population. In fact, genocide. So, unfortunately, the common term of civil war elides that. Lorena Cabnal contends that cuerpo tierra represents an ontological continuum between earth and bodies. It is at once a cosmological and epistemological proposal, and most importantly, a political call by communitarian feminists to defend and recuperate the body as a territory, the giver of life. So that's extracted from uh, Rosa de Ventos Lopez, Eimer, and Nina Franco's work. To extend a little bit more in R Lorena Cardinal's work, um, this is actually from an interview in French, so Francophone people can enjoy some reception of her work, not too many English speakers, unfortunately, at this point. Uh, but I decided to just use some of that. Um, and it's from an interview conducted and translated by Jules Falke. It is since 2003 that the association between women, Amix Massa, 
from the mountain of Halapram, we imagined and developed our slogan, Defense of the Body, Territory and Territory Earth. Analysis of territory leads to two threads, that of cosmogony, of the interpretation of life, and that of communitarian feminism, community feminism. I think in the original it was communitarian, so <laughs> just saying. It is a question of defending the territory body in the face of different specific violences that we experience as women, sexual violence and femicides. Since 2004, 2005, the transnational mining industry has grown in Guatemala. The fight has become particularly important from 2008 to 2019, the sort of high point of the commodity boom of primary resources, when the government granted 31 operating licenses to transnationals, triggering a veritable uprising with strong mobilizations of women and other actors. It was then that was born within Abiyala, the historical slogan of recovery and defense of the territory earth. A key word for the future of community feminism emerged. As women in struggle, we are one with the struggles. In fact, it is mainly women that put their bodies on the line and are on the front line against police, army, paramilitary groups deployed to occupy territory of future mines or dams. So you can see why I said now it's important for us to look at women's struggles very broadly and on specific grounds. Yeah? It's not enough to think about this unitary category of women and women's rights. Or even to imagine gender as a merely personal feature, right? But instead something that interlocks within the pertaining order and its economies. For this reason, feminists such as the already cited Julieta Paredes, but also um, other compañeras in Mujeres Creando from Bolivia talk about the need for the depatriarchalization of land and life. Okay, what is this? There are many forms of patriarchal violence of male partners or ex partners of the state, as Las Tesis would have it, the police and the courts, within mining and other extractive industries, and the cultures and relations they generate. It is enacted on women's and plural bodies. And when committed against territory, the means of social reproduction and survival of life itself. There is that of the armies, the paramilitaries, and vested transnational power. However, these are all interconnected. So this is the challenge for us to think about feminisms in this light. Yeah? For Veronica Gargo, financialization, a key feature of neoliberalism, enacted through microcredit and other loan schemes, compounds precaritization by the indebtedness of women, coupled with the double burden of work at home and outside of the home, including in the informal economy and in unregulated industries with few rights or protections. These are economies of vulnerability and also forms of violence, or that can, can create the condition of violence. Hay que politizar las violencias contra las mujeres y los cuerpos feminizados porque las vincula con las violencias de la acumulación capitalista contemporánea. We have to politicize violence against women and feminized bodies because it links them with the violences of capitalist, contemporary capitalist accumulation. These aren't divorced, right? They're not just individual affairs that a woman goes missing, that a woman is um, violated, or um, sorry for any tri triggering language, by the way, and I understand this is extremely sensitive, but. I think that politically, politically we need to understand the different keys and levels on which this occurs. Yeah. So Julieta Paredes talks of the importance of a depatriarchalization of land in life. At that point where patriarchy combines with capitalist coloniality. This is an outbreak of what she terms el entronque patriarcal, the patriarchal junction, that binds the inherited characteristics of patriarchy in Latin America its manifestations in contemporary capitalist coloniality. So, for example, you can have what Rita Segato refers to as low-intensity um, low forms of patriarchy that can exist also in non-Western communities, right? But they're only made more 
exacerbated by these sorts of forces, historically and over time in the contemporary sphere. That's the juncture that she's speaking about. All right, so I'm foregrounding a little bit the insights from autonomous feminism, for example, from the women from Mujeres de Ando in Bolivia. Autonomous feminists, Bolivian feminists, from before Evo Morales' rise to power, became community feminists, and sometimes in contestation with his project, because they found that Evo Morales' regime as leftist and progressive as it could be, was still very anti-women, right? And just gender um, line. Women creating, and Kenneth Brown was co founded by her as an example of the foundation of the female. They feminized the word, usually it's colectivo. The idea of the despatriarchalization del cuerpo, ending patriarchal control of the body, has become a fundamental dimension in the process of decolonization in Bolivia. Mujeres creando uphold the slogan, there is no decolonization without depatriarchalization. Mujeres creando affirms that the depatriarchalization of the body territory and the land territory is meaningless without the decolonization of the people. This slogan has spread among indigenous and feminist movements in the region. The metaphor of weaving and reweaving worlds, one that Mujeres Criando invokes and enacts, is also very relevant. Decolonizing lands and life. And we can see examples of foremothers, even those no longer with us, right? What they have contributed within their struggles. I'm going to have to sort of speed through these remaining slides, but it's, this speaks as well to a transversal politics, right? Particularly if you sort of see the way in which the connections that I started with between a group like Ni Una Menos can make us think of the work of women who organise against fumigation of the communities by agro-industrial um, corporations that use things like glyphosate. Yeah, and poison their waterways. Because they, they, as mothers, have discovered that they, their children are having cognitive deficits, are breaking out in rashes. That's the kind of things that they organize around, but they use slogans that connect even to new and even if they don't call themselves feminists, right? They're capable of working transversally, right? And I guess that reminds us a little bit of uh, Raul Sebeki's notion of uh, societies in movement, not to get trapped within a notion of a social movement as a kind of coherent, you know, um, even hermetic entity that acts in uh, dispute with or in democratizing processes in concert with the state as part of civil society. No. What we have here instead are societies in movement, territorially based to a great extent too, between the urban and the rural, yeah? The peri-urban, people who organize within uh, informal neighborhoods as well, and settlements, right? They often have this ingenuity to work across different political axes and bring together different languages of the political and generate varying subjectivities of feminized resistances. So that's kind of the tenor of, I guess, how I wanted to bring some of these struggles together with some of the different voices. The place of the body is really significant here as well. The place of performance, as we've seen, or even what's entitled not performance. And then, obviously, the body and territory as spaces for theorizing one's realities and responses to domination, right? So let's talk more in the tutorial. <laughs> uh, we have a few activities to do, so you have a little bit of, you know, leverage in terms of what you might like to focus upon. There's a poem, there's a video performance, there's, there's segments from um, that statement on the, on the women's strike. I was gonna go a little bit more into the women's strike in this lecture, but I didn't really have time. So we'll leave it there, and we'll see each other in the tutorial. If not today, then tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Can you say what you said just then again? What do you think of this process of being organized? And how do you think of this? And 
but for the interest is basically for theorizing, but also for articulating consequences. That's probably a better way of saying it than I just did. I try to add you as far as possible. <laughs> Thank you. 